epistasis occurs when the genotype of one gene affects expression of another gene. Epistasis may seem like a complex concept, but it can be reduced to a few simple moving parts. This doggy represents one gene called B. Epistasis occurs when another gene called A affects its expression. Think of A as holding B on a leash. We will see that the leash can come in different types. Why is there epistasis? Well, epistasis can emerge any time in most single gene traits. Take, for example, formation of hair on the leaf surface of the plant Arabidopsis. A gene called H might have a recessive allele, little h, that confers hairless appearance. As predicted by Mendel, when heterozygous big H little h is selfed, we get a good 3 to 1 ratio of hairy to hairless. Is this a nice single gene trait? Not really. We know from multiple experimental evidence that the H gene works together with many other genes, as represented by this network, where every ball is a gene and every line represents an interaction between two genes. Therefore, while the action of a gene may appear isolated, no gene is an island. Instead, it works together with many other genes. When variation as these other genes occurs, epistasis can result. Let's see how it works. I will use three examples where gene A is epistatic on gene B to illustrate three cases, recessive, dominant, and double recessive epistasis. The real gene names may be different in reality, but I will stick to A and B for comparison. In all cases, I will deal with the phenotypes in F2 individuals formed by selfing a double heterozygote with big A little a, big B little b genotype. The following assumptions apply. Big A is dominant to little a, big B is dominant to little b. The A and B loci are unlinked. We expect four phenotypic classes, one that has at least one big A and one big B allele, another with at least one big A and little b, little b, a third with little a, little a, and at least one big b, and a fourth with little a, little a, little b, little b, the double recessive homozygote. The underlying mark refers to either of the two possible alleles. In all cases, b can act as a regular Mendelian gene affecting a character for which there is a dominant and a recessive trait. Let's start with recessive epistasis. Big B confers black coat in Labrador retrievers. Little B, little B, brown coat. The big B allele encodes a functional enzyme that converts a brown pigment into a black pigment. The little B allele encodes an inactive form that cannot produce the black pigment. This would be simple, but there is a catch. A second gene, big A, is epistatic on B. It encodes a protein necessary for deposition of the pigment. If the big A protein is not present, that is, if little a is homozygous, the coat is yellow. So let's consider the four classes. If the big A and big B alleles are present, black pigment is formed. If big A is present, but not big B, brown pigment is formed. If big A is absent, yellow coat results. The expected ratio is 9 black to 3 brown to 4 yellow. Let's look at these phenotypes in a 4x4 Punnett square where the gamete types are marked on the sides. Yellow appears in 4 square where the B gene action does not count because of the absence of big A. The other squares are free to undergo whatever color change the B genotype dictates, such as brown and black. If you step back and look at the whole layout, you see that four squares out of 16 display the yellow epistatic condition. Therefore, we call this recessive epistasis. Let's now consider dominant epistasis in squash. The setup is very similar to that of the black lab dog. The B gene encodes a protein that converts green pigment into yellow. The accumulation of pigment, however, is controlled by an epistatic gene called A. However, 
instead of promoting pigment accumulation, A is a repressor that blocks it. Pigment can only be formed in the absence of the big A allele, such as when the little A allele is homozygous. Let's look at the four phenotypic classes. The presence of big A results in white squashes. In the absence of the big A repressor, big B results in yellow squashes, and little b, little b in green squashes. The F2 ratio is 12 white, 3 yellow, and 1 green. In the Punnett square, we mark green the double homozygote recessive, yellow the three squares that have big B but lack big A, and the rest are white. Looking at the layout, the epistatic big A allele affects three quarters of the 16 squares in a typical dominant ratio. Last, let's consider the case of double recessive epistasis in the snail. Here, the B gene converts colorless precursor 2 into a dark pigment, resulting in a dark shell. The A gene is epistatic because it is needed for the conversion of upstream colorless precursor 1 into precursor 2. Consider the pathway. It yields dark pigment only if both the A and the B genes have the dominant, that is, active allele. The F2 progenies display two phenotypes, dark and albino, in a 9 to 7 ratio. Looking at this in the Punnett square, we mark as dark the squares where both big A and big B are present. The rest are albino. The albino F2s are laid out in an unusual pattern. This, however, makes sense. The four square marked in orange represent the four out of 16. If we now exclude these, the remaining three albino squares are three out of 12. Therefore, a three to one ratio is displayed twice, as one may expect in a double recessive situation. In summary, an organism is a complex structure whose traits depend on chain of events, each controlled by different gene. Epistasis results when variation in genes required for upstream events affects the events downstream.